It came at night, hideous and shriveled, with glaring eyes and long, bony fingers. It was, in many ways, an archetypal vampire. Undead, the blood gorge revenant of a long, lifeless corpse. And yet, the impact that this so-called ghastly fiend has had on British, indie global folklore, is incomparable triggering decades of debate and even, quite possibly, inspiring Bram Stoker's infamous Count Dracula. After all, the story of the vampire of Kroglin Grange is indisputably eerie, providing a glimpse into a history of vampirism that stretches back far further than the century to which the tale belongs, causing us to call into question everything that we have come to understand about life, death, and the hideous, haunting space in between. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. In the shadowy realm of folklore, the vampire exists as a timeless horror, a nocturnal entity steeped in mystique and dread, with an insatiable thirst for the forbidden crimson elixir that courses through the veins of the living. And yet, these parasitic predators are not always folkloric. Sometimes they are said to be very real, able to emerge from the shadows so as to feed on the living, sucking them of their vital energy, in much the same way as an unwanted subscription service might drain you and your bank account. And so, before we dive too deep into this topic, if you could please entertain a brief intrusion and allow me to thank the sponsor of this video, Rocket Money. Rocket Money is the personal finance app that helps you cancel subscriptions and manage your money better, meaning you can lower bills, build a custom budget, and grow your savings all in one place. I am sure you can empathise if I tell you about a recent horrific experience I had trying to cancel a subscription to an online service. Endless scrolling and links that kept me in some manner of twisted time loop sent round and inevitably back round to the same dead-end webpage. It was nightmarish. In the end, I was able to cancel the subscription, but not without feeling as though I had lost far more than just money by the end of it. My sanity predated upon by an unseen energy feeder. With Rocket Money, however, stressful cancellations are a thing of the past. Their easy-to-use, all-in-one finance platform safely and securely identifies recurring charges and cancels unwanted subscriptions for you. You can even cancel from within app with just a couple of taps. So, no need to fret about customer service calls, no frustrating, dead-end circular linking web pages. In fact, this feature is so simple and impressive that Rocket Money has helped save its customers an average of $720 a year, with over $500 million in cancelled subscriptions. Given that the new year is upon us, now is arguably the best time to consider our finances and how we can save more and spend less. And so, shake off the curse of bloodsuckers by taking control of your finances today. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash paranormal to get started for free. Try it today and unlock even more features with premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash paranormal, or click the link in the description. Thank you for listening and thus helping to support my channel. Now, on with the video. The story of the vampire of Kroglin Grange first reached popular attention in 1896 via the six-volume autobiography of prolific English travel writer and biographer Augustus J.C. Hare. In it, Hare introduces the tale as belonging to Captain Edward Fisher Rowe, a man with whom he enjoyed after-dinner conversation in 1874. Kroglin Grange, so the captain allegedly told Hare and others at the gathering, had been the home of the Fisher family for many generations, and it was with a heavy heart that they decided to move away and offer their comfortable Cumberland country house for rent. The new residents were a sister and two brothers. They, so we are told through Augustus Hare's autobiography, were kind and beneficent, and soon became very popular within the local community. As such, they passed their first few months at Kroglin Grange in peace. It wasn't until the summer that they realised there was something strange about their new home. That particular day had been unusually and uncomfortably hot, and so by the time night drew in, the sister was sitting awake in bed, restless, looking out through her window at the night sky. The entire property was single storey, and so her bedroom, along with her brother's, was situated on the ground floor. 
and so it was, propped against her pillows, that she supposedly noticed two lights, which flickered in and out in the belt of trees which separated the lawn from the churchyard. As her gaze became fixed upon them, she is said to have seen something emerge, a definite, ghastly something, which seemed every moment to become nearer, increasing in size and substance as it approached. According to the testimony relayed by Captain Fisher Rowe, as she watched it, the most uncontrollable horror seized her. And yet, as greatly as the sister wanted to get away, she was too fearful, too paralyzed to do so. After all, she had locked the door to her bedroom and, as it was beside the window, would have to linger there, closer to the figure coming towards the house, if she wanted to flee. And so, she remained, terrified in bed. Then, when the terrible object on the other side of the glass seemed to turn, as if about to go around the house and not towards her, she leapt from the bed to make her escape. And yet, just as she rushed to unlock her bedroom door, she heard a distinct and terrifying scratch, scratch, scratch on the window. Turning, she is said to have seen a hideous brown face with flaming eyes glaring in at her. The sister abandoned the door and rushed back to the bed, terrified but glad at least that the window was fastened shut. That was until the creature supposedly began to pick at the lead, ultimately loosening a diamond pane of glass and making it fall to the floor. With there now a hole in the window, the hideous, flaming-eyed creature is said to have pushed its hand through the opening, so as to reach the handle and open the window. Entrance to the room granted, we are told through Hare's autobiography that the creature came in and came up to the bed. Twisting its long, bony fingers in the woman's hair, it supposedly dragged her over the side of the bed and bit her violently in the throat. The woman's screaming alerted her brothers, who both came rushing to the room. The door, however, was still locked, and so they were forced to break it open. By the time they got inside, the creature was gone, and their sister lay unconscious, bleeding violently from a wound in the throat. One brother stayed to tend to the injured young woman, the other rushed from the house in pursuit of her attacker. His dinner guest gripped, Captain Fisher Rowe is then said to have revealed how the monstrous creature fled in the moonlight, before eventually disappearing over the wall into the churchyard. And so, creature unapprehended, the brother returned to Crogling Grange. There, his sister, injured but alive, told her brothers what had happened. They worried that a lunatic may have escaped from a local asylum, and yet, upon investigation, there was no record of any such thing. Regardless, the sister's wound eventually healed, and her brothers, traumatized by the ordeal, took to sleeping in the room just across the hallway from her keeping their pistols ever loaded, just in case the lunatic returned. Summer over, the winter is said to have passed most peacefully and happily. And yet, when March came, the sister is said to have been suddenly awakened, one night, by an all-too-familiar sound. That of a scratch, scratch, scratch on her bedroom window. Looking at it, she was horrified to see the same hideous brown, shriveled face with glaring eyes looking in at her. Her brothers and their pistols were summoned, and the creature chased across the lawn and away once more towards the churchyard. This time, after successfully shooting the fiend in the leg, thus slowing its pace, the brothers were able to observe it scurrying inside an old vault. The next day, Sir so Captain Fisher Rowe relates via Augustus Hare's memoir, the brothers summoned all the tenants of Crogling Grange, and in their presence, the vault was opened. A horrible scene is said to have revealed itself. The vault was full of coffins, they had been broken open, and their contents, horribly mangled and distorted, were scattered over the floor. One coffin alone supposedly remained intact, and so its lid was lifted and insides inspected. Brown, withered, shriveled, mummified, but quite entire, it was the same hideous figure that had attacked the sister. Not only that, the corpse is claimed to have borne a bullet wound in its leg, inflicted, no doubt, by the brothers as they had chased it from the house. And so it was, we are told, that they did the only thing they could have. They burnt the undead fiend. After that, peace was restored to Crogling Grange. Thus is the story of the Vampire of Crogling Grange, short and sweet and utterly horrifying, 
for indeed, one must remember that this blood-sucking tale predates Bram Stoker's famous Dracula, and was presented as a real occurrence. The very much real Augustus Hare featuring it in his very much real autobiography, after it was relayed to him by the very much real Captain Edward Fisher Rowe. Of course, over the years there have been many attempts to debunk this story. After all, the names of the three siblings were not given in the original publication, putting a question mark over the genuineness of their existence. That said, later sources have attempted rehabilitation, giving their surname as Cranswell, with the brothers named Edward and Michael, and the sister Amelia. It is also speculated that the trio occupied the house at some point in the 1870s. Even then, there are other issues with the Croglin Grange vampire, with some commentators highlighting how the story is suspiciously similar to the fictional Varney the Vampire, a penny dreadful published as a weekly serial from 1845 to 1847. Indeed, the gothic horror's opening chapters can be said to be highly reminiscent of Captain Fisher Rowe's later allegedly true account, specifically in regards to the damsel in distress young woman who suffers an attack by a vampire in her bedchamber. Not only does the fiend enter her room by the window, he also taps his long fingernails on the glass before doing so. This has led to some, including Paul Adams, the author of Written in Blood, The Cultural History of the British Vampire, to declare that it is not difficult to conclude that either Fisher Rowe or Augustus Hare had a copy of Varney the Vampire in their library. And yet, while such may be a fair assessment, other researchers have fought back, asserting the truth of the Kroglin Grange story. After all, despite efforts by sceptics to undermine the very existence of the house, namely the single-storey Kroglin Grange, there is evidence to show that Kroglin Low Hall, a country property in the same area of England, was known as Kroglin Grange up until the beginning of the 18th century, and had at one time been a single-storey house. It even stood adjacent to a church, as the story tells, although this was demolished during the very much earlier than the 1870s English Civil War. The churchyard, however, would have realistically remained. And so, truth is to be found in relation to the tale. Because of this, it has been suggested that the vampire story which came to Augustus Hare via Captain Fisher Rowe, whilst not necessarily fictional, may instead represent a long-standing oral tradition within the Fisher Rowe family, a story passed from one generation to the next which boasted material substantiation in the form of a blocked-up window in the house said to be the very window through which the sister's blood-sucking hideous fiend entered so as to attack her. Today, the window can still be seen, laden with horseshoes meant to keep evil away. Not only that, when one looks, one finds that the story has strong foundations within the wider Kroglin community, with an account by a former rector of the village detailing how there were stories of vampire attacks and sightings of a strange bat-like creature associated with the grave of another local clergyman, Reverend George Sanderson, who officiated the village in the late 1600s. Conceivably, such may serve as an origin for Captain Fisher Rowe's later Kroglin Grange story. And so, all of this truly gives a sense of the importance of the Kroglin Grange story, if not as a thoroughly true happening, but at the very least as an artefact of local folklore and belief. After all, even in the late 1800s, the concept of the vampire was nothing new. Elsewhere in the north of England, we know that people had been performing vampire burials since the 11th century, with the Yorkshire village of Warren Percy all but scaring itself to extinction by the 1500s. After burying over 100 so-called vampires, the once flourishing village fell to desertion. Indeed, an archaeological excavation in the 1960s uncovered deep pits full of skeletons, showing signs of having been burnt, mutilated, and dismembered. Modern examination of the remains has even proven that, far from being the result of a massacre or cannibalism fueled by famine, the mutilations were deliberately made after death, most likely in an attempt to prevent corpse reanimation and plague by bloodsucking. Strikingly, travelling south to Nottinghamshire, there is even evidence of similar vampire burials having been performed as early as 550 CE. 
Such evidence deftly disarms the long-held belief that vampire mythology came into England more recently from Eastern Europe, evolving from the fearsome Transylvanian Strigoi and other similar folkloric entities. Not so, vampires have always been in the British Isles. The people of Warren Percy, after all, knew that there was something to fear in the dark. Certainly, according to Montague Summers in his seminal book, The Vampire in Europe, the histories of vampirism in England are perhaps few, but this is not so much because they do not occur, as rather that they are carefully hushed up and stifled. Hushed up and stifled, perhaps, in a similar manner to how the vampire of Crogling Grange has been warped and reshapen with each passing generation. And so, maybe some manner of vampiric creature did pay a visit to Crogling Grange at some point in the house's history. Oral traditions are, it must be remembered, easy to take for granted, with details susceptible to becoming mixed up or lost. The central moral, however, often remains, transmitted as a crucial piece of information for the children of those who came before to learn from, guard, and pass on to their own offspring. In this case, that the night is not always safe, and that death does not necessarily mean the end. For indeed, the message behind the vampire of Croglin Grange continues to this day, even if those who interact with the house, now Croglin Low Hall, do not entirely remember the full story. Do not know why a downstairs window is bricked up and heavy with horseshoes. They are not pretty decorations, but protective amulets with a symbolism that has a history of its own being a testament to the human story and the things that we will believe when faced with the unknown, the unnerving, and quite possibly even the undead. Thank you so much for watching, I truly hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe, being sure to click the bell icon to turn on all notifications for more of the paranormal. And if you cannot wait until my next video, why not watch the one suggested on screen now? Until next time, I wish you a happy new year and all the very best of things for 2024.